Aloha, and this is The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Aleon, and we broadcast live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. here in the heart of downtown at Pioneer Plaza. Now, I am thrilled. I'm always thrilled. Fridays are my favorite day for this reason, but we've got a super fantastic, I'd like to say, fabouche guest with <laughs> us today, Mr. Robert Reed in the house. Uh, uh, bon vivant, an artist extraordinaire, a man handy with a glue gun. <laughs> What's well, yeah. not to like? Welcome. Thank you. Welcome it's great to, to be the here. show. I'm excited. You are a busy, busy man, as mm -hmm. many of our guests here on The Art of Life, and I'm really delighted that you're able to take some time out of your busy schedule to join us and to share and enlighten us all the magic of how you came to be and what floats your boat and what have you. So. Let's find out the creation story. Tell us about the days of being a zygote. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I guess it, um, I was born in Searcy, Arkansas. Okay. And um, my grandparents were um, hillbillies, actually, from Arkansas. I mean, they, I don't think they even had an outhouse until I was 12. I mean, we're talking hillbillies. So, um, but then I was born in Searcy, Arkansas. My dad got the GI Bill and mm -hmm. was in the Korean War um, at the end of it, and the so they were able War. to um, to buy a house, and, and he became a mechanical engineer, which was pretty amazing. And then I was raised in Independence, Missouri. Okay, the Show Me Harry State. Truman, yeah, yes. Show Me State, and the RLDS uh, World Headquarters also, so there was a lot of things going on there. Yeah. And um, I lived there until I graduated from high school, then moved out for a while, and then ended up in South Florida for about 10 years. Um, there I uh, lived, at the end I got hired by a major airline. They sent me to Washington, D.C. for a couple years, mm -hmm. and then I transferred to New York City, and I'm still based there, so I commute oh, okay. from here to New York every month. So I like to tomorrow, say... Actually. From the <laughs> from the big apple to the pineapple, <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that. I like that. Excellent. So, in addition to all of these, your your jet setting and your global travels, mm -hmm. your art certainly takes us on a journey. How mm -hmm. did you know? What was the seed of inspiration, or that little twitch, or that itch that you knew you had to express yourself? Did it start at a young age, or was it something you stumbled into, or were you encouraged? All of those good things. Uh, it I guess it's always been there, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't really, um, when I was living in New York, um, I was dating an artist and I was, I was going out in costumes for like gay pride parade and roller skates as a right. poodle and um, <laughs> crazy things like that, but I never really thought of it as artwork right. and I always wanted to go to art school and then I, then I started painting and had some success with that and really enjoyed that and um, I was flying during 9/11, and was actually watched by some by the some of the terrorists that were um, in the fatal crashes. But um, uh, after that, I decided to come here uh, to get away from it all. And while I was here, um, uh, they had another accident with our airlines, and I was not going to get back and go on a plane. So I decided to stay for a week, and I met someone who is now my husband. Joe DePaulis, and, um, and decided to stay, and I took a two-year leave of absence, and during that time I thought, well, I'm going to get my residency, and I've always wanted to go to art school, so I went up to UH, yeah. and um, was excited about the glass program, so I started out in glass. Rick Mills? Yes, yeah. yes. The almost, Yeah, he's great. So I almost ended up uh, majoring in that, mm -hmm. and then at the very end, I took a wearable art class uh, with Madeline Soder, and um, she was, you know, like these make your costumes. They're, you know, it's I didn't think of it as art before, and I, so that took me on a whole different tangent, and um, which led into performance because then Mary Babcock came in and she had a performance background. Yeah. So it just keeps evolving and changing. And, um, so I, I, I would consider myself a sculptor, I guess, with all of it. Absolutely. So Three dimensional. Um, also, works. Tiari Duchere was a, uh, a teacher there that was a grad student, and she told me, I, I think, in 3D, and that really changed my life, too, because I think it's true. Although I like to paint, but. Yeah. Um, 
so many things that you say that just make me pause <laughs> the cause. As I like to say, the synapses are, are firing off there. You said something that is of interest, and I like to, um, I want to return to that because mm. I think it's always important for our viewers to consider this because mm. we want the art of life to be that dialogue, not mm. only with the artists we have on the show, mm -hmm. but we want you guys out there to have a dialogue with yourself and to assess these things. You mentioned that you didn't think of your, your costuming or your four ways into that as art. And I think that this is something that is actually quite common mm. with a lot of creative people. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily be quick to, to be dismissive and say it's self-doubt, but maybe even humility is, is part mm -hmm. of that equation of like something that maybe comes natural or that feels um, like a very easy extension of the self or um, what have you. We don't, we're the last to think of it as something to do. Forgive me, I have to do this. <clears throat> yes, I had a cold last week, so this is the dregs. Ugh. Not, I'm not communicable, I promise. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was the same thing for myself. It was an old beau that mm -hmm. said to me, why don't you get your degree in dance? Like, this is such a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You're already a dancer. You've already lived abroad and you've danced. And mm -hmm. to be honest with you, until he had said that, I never considered it as, as even an option. And so right. it's interesting. What do you think might have been the reason for that? Was it just a pie-in-the-sky thing? or? Well, I... Yeah, I think um, that it, you know, I, I was, co I wasn't considering costumes, mm -hmm. I guess, as part of the art world, yeah. per se, and um, uh, and and I work outside of the realm. I don't use um, artist supplies. Like I don't really use paint, and I don't and clay so much. I I, I use whatever is available. So I. I um, the show really fits with me, I think, because it, it is a reflection of just me being. Yeah. So I didn't really think of myself as an artist because it seemed like that was a, a choice you had to make mm -hmm. to be the starving artist and be a painter or you know or a ceramicist and 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 that's definitely there. But um, but for me, it wasn't there. I was using you know found objects and and I just hadn't really gone down that path. So I, and I hadn't taken the time to go down that path. You know, I think we've kind of also, um, we're in this interesting time period where these concepts and these ideas of wearable art and ups, uh, reusing, recycling and all those mm -hmm. things, those are kind of at the forefront of people's consciousness. Whether they do it or not is, is debatable, but it's mm -hmm. there. And then, of course, good old Project Runway. It was Thursday last mm -hmm. night, and I tune in because I'm invested in the show. Mm -hmm. I like watching it. But whenever they have the non-traditional challenge, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've always think that those are the most interesting, and those are the ones that kind of tug at my heartstrings because, you know, I remember the days of going into Florida or Ben Franklin mm -hmm. or what have you, and. My inclination is always to put everything on my head, you know? <laughs> Anytime I see something fabulous, it's like, it must be on my head. Well, how can I put this on my head? Um, your artwork, I think, is a lot like that, in oh, the definitely. sense that mm -hmm. you have this abundance of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and if it were a piece of music, people might think of it as a cacophony, but it is very meticulous. Mm -hmm. You're very meticulous. You're very mm -hmm. detail-oriented. There is always in all of that mayhem, the initial like, ah, oh, what is this? Mm -hmm. When you get closer, there's a lot of things going on mm -hmm. with what you do. What's your process in um, bringing all of these elements together? Because there has to be some type of curatorial process, perhaps some hoarding tendencies, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but to amass all of these things to put something together. Well, I, I would say that I think of even though I just said I'm a 3D artist, <laughs> I would say that I think of almost everything as a painting. Yeah. And so it starts out with usually a little sketch or an idea in my head, and I, I know the direction I'm going, but um, as of the painting, the, for me anyway, the, the end product is never how it started. Absolutely. So along the way, I will, some other concept will fit into what I'm working, and I think, oh, what could I use for that? Oh, this will work for that. Or sometimes it's just, you know, you're walking by and they're having a sale on something that's that's a cheap supply, and I'm like, wow, that actually works with what I'm doing, and so, I'll, you know, grab that or a little I, divine intervention. Yeah. yeah, and I think it also just keeps everything keeps evolving with me because of storage space. Mm -hmm. I, I take apart things and then, 
but I don't throw them out and then I'll work on something like two projects later and say, oh, I had that and that would actually work with this in a different context and then I, and so I use it that way. A very common mantra at my house is, I'm using it for an art project. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> my dear mother is so tired of hearing that. I mean, oh, right. she's just thinking like, oh my God, my daughter is becoming a hoarder. But that's the beauty is that yeah. you can hang on to those elements for several weeks or months or heaven forbid, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But then when that moment strikes and you go through the catalog and the Rolodex in your mind, it's like, ah, oh, I've got that purple whatever yeah, oh, the minute you throw it away you're going to need it exactly you know, you know. it's true it's true we touch wood because that's true <laughs> um what else all kinds of good stuff so you work a lot with these costumes i'm curious how you store these items are they intended as one-offs um, and I say this because back in the stone ages yes i was a go-go dancer in raves that's probably the only <laughs> non-medicated person at a rave, <laughs> such a lamb for slaughter. I didn't realize that everybody else was, but I would make these funky little outfits. Mm -hmm. And some of them would, they would withstand the rigors of movement and dance, mm -hmm. but they may not necessarily be wearable three or four or five right. times in a row. Mm -hmm. Obviously the belly dance customs are different. Mm -hmm. Skill sets better now. Mm -hmm. And some things were really just intended to be for a special event. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, when you create your costumes, mm -hmm. um, is it that whole spectrum of different types of things? Do you wear them again? Do you cannibalize them to use them for something else? I Do you much, repeat you wear? Know, I cannibalize them to use them for something else and repeat them. Yeah. And within the last two years, I always made them and wore them and performed in them myself. Right. And, and kind of had a resistance for making them for someone else. but. Recently, through um, Manic Art, it's mm -hmm. called, um, in, in Columbia, Maryland, they've been having these wearable art contests uh, based on uh, New Zealand's WOW. I don't know if you ever looked up World of Wearable Art. Um, oh. great. And Manic Art has okay. a great website, too. But um, So I've been making them for models to wear, and they've been purchasing them. So they've um, collected, I think, eight of them so far, which is wow. great because then I have to make something new, you know, so it's, I don't have that as a resource because I will take it apart and make it into something else, which is, which is fine too, but then you just have the photograph, you don't have the actual thing and they're actually keeping them as a collection. Yeah. And using them, I think eventually for dance also, so. That's so awesome. That's, yeah. Different. I'm curious who some of your artistic um, influences are. It's kind of all over the place, you know, from Nick Cave who makes, you know, great fiber art to the B-52s, yeah. you know, wearing bird cages on their head in the Lee 80s. Lee Bowery. To Lee Bowery, definitely, yeah. for sure. Which Maybe Miss Grace something Jones. Something you said earlier that he thinks humiliation is a powerful drive, and and I agree with that statement a lot. Um, yeah. Grace Jones, definitely. So I'm definitely an, an 80s child. I kind of think that when you come into your 20s, you mm -hmm. kind of get stuck in that period, or at least I did, or maybe it's because I stopped driving, so I don't listen to the radio anymore so yeah. much. So. Well, the music was so phenomenal then, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not biased. I'm just <laughs> testifying. But so, there was so yeah. much diversity mm -hmm. in the 80s. I mm -hmm. mean, I think it's surprising to me where we have all these different outlets and these venues and facilities to get information, and yet sometimes they just seem to be cut from the same cloth. Whereas mm -hmm. when you look at the 80s, you would have Culture Club and Sade right. mm -hmm. and the fabulous Thunderbirds and B-52s and you know if you were lucky you might even hear all of them on the same radio station right. which you know I think about that now and it kind of blows my mind that's just right. insane yeah. in, in the best of ways of right. course I'm curious if you go through phases of colors or motifs or shapes uh. hmm I think I, there's just so many influences out there anymore yeah. that I'm sure I do and I'm not even aware of it. You know, like I, well, you were talking about influences, like, of course, Lady Gaga, I'm, you know, Alexander McQueen yeah. and totally influenced by them now. But, um, so I would say I, I, I probably, I'm really have a strange awareness, I think, of pop culture by it by just infusion so I think by what's going on now I kind of incorporate that mm -hmm. a lot of times into my work to try to make it current with that so that people of all ages can relate to it I like it but um, 
Did that answer your question? I guess. This is but not I, a test. Okay. There's no trap door over there. Okay. <laughs> Pull the lever. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have to take a break. One of three. So grab yourself a glass of water. Stay tuned because we have parts two and three, and you don't want to miss it. We've got a fabouche slideshow coming <laughs> right up on The Art of Life. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host, together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. See, wasn't that short? We're not going to leave you in the lurch. We've got part two coming up here, The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang. Now, if you have missed any of our back episodes, they're all on YouTube, and they're all conveniently on the Art of Life Facebook page. Do all the dirty work for you. So basically, you have no excuse. This is our wonderful guest, Robert Reed in the house. Hello. Bon vivant, <laughs> artist extraordinaire. And you have provided us a fantastic slideshow, which we are going to go through. And you're going to okay. tell us all about it. Great. So, maestro, let's get some visuals here. Okay, this um, was at the Honolulu Academy of Art, and I um, started build. Oh, it's going faster than that. Uh, I was building a miniature golf course out of um, found objects, mm -hmm. and then this was up at Spalding House, and I was also sculpt. Here I sculpted um, air mattresses into a maze. I have to ask. Mm -hmm. Who put all the air in the air mattress? Oh, I, ha I rented a, um, a pump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would hope so. Yeah, definitely. Oh, my goodness. I have bad ref uh, memories of blowing those things up. And yeah. so basically, I just was going to show through this, like this section here is about um, how I do site specific things a lot. And that mermaid changed into this mermaid because I love the staircase there at Lenny Kona. This was at the Modern Hotel here, um, a mermaid performance I did there. And then she became my toilet and my <laughs> bathroom eventually for a Christmas party that we had. So um, this was at uh, Northern Illinois University and I used a food sealer to take all my treasures and make a time capsule. Fancy. And then that became a dress uh, for Manic Art in Maryland and it's uh, going to be shown and here's me as a poodle before, as a, <laughs> I was a human trapped in a poodle body for performance. And then Eva Enriquez is uh, modeling um, made out of scrubbies. And this is, I had gone to a Marie Antoinette exhibit in Paris. So that's two different forms of Marie Antoinette and the apathy of that. One is made out of trash bags, the other in heating balloons. There's another uh, costume that I made. Um, it's a straight jacket wedding gown. Um, that Manic Art purchased. Um, and then this relates to me <laughs> being a flight attendant. I performed and wrote and cast, directed to the sets for My Titties Are Jet Lagged, which was a, <laughs> a spoof on the airline industry. Oh my. And these, I've been doing some small sculptures lately. That uh, This one is called Scarred, which is about bullying. Um, it's uh, Georgie Porgy burned into a potty chair. And this one is called the Fornicakers, which is the myth that gay men constantly have sex. So I have these G.I. Joes having a cupcake orgy. <laughs> and these are going to be an exhibit um, at Erase Hate Through Art in Columbia, Maryland next Congratulations. month. Congratulations. That's wonderful. So I'm curious because artists, I, I read this quote and I wish I could attribute to who it was. I'll do the research on this, folks. But it was, it was basically saying... Um, an artist is always in the position of wanting to be recognized and wanting to hide. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was really brilliant. And it the reason is. why that mm -hmm. came to mind is when you have your uh, costume-based art mm -hmm. or your wearable art, mm -hmm. you often have like a zentai suit where it covers um, the skin and mm -hmm. the body and the face, mm -hmm. maybe the recognizable features that would make it what people think of as mm -hmm. you, per se, Robert Reed. 
clearly that's intentional, but I want to know the reason behind it for you, and what mm -hmm. does that allow for you to have the suit on, and then to build the costume around that? I, uh, I would say that I, you know, I, d I don't want it to appear as me. I like to transform into right. something else, and I think that always help, helps you transform. And it also, I was a really shy child, and actually became a waiter and a bartender and a flight attendant to overcome that. And um, that also helps me overcome that. So when you're in, have a mask on, you can be a different person completely. Yeah, it's and, transformative. Uh, and people that you know might even interact with you differently. So, um, so you're right on with that. Yeah. Um, do you find that people are scared, or they do they get nervous? Do they get spooked? Because some of the the outfits you have. I was at the Museum of Natural History about two months ago, mm -hmm. and when you go into like the African wing and you see these mm -hmm. shamanistic um, ensembles and outfits and masks, I mean, there's some similarities there mm -hmm. of, the, of the shapes, of the forms, of the masks. Mm -hmm. Do people get nervous? I mean, have they expressed that to you, or you know, what's they the do. range they, of emotions? Some people get nervous. Some mm -hmm. people get angry. You know, some people get overjoyed. Yeah. But I've always uh, felt like. You know, the, a, a child is the one that is really the best judge because yeah. they, they always just are honest right from the get go. You know, like right. a lot of children are really frightened of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, <laughs> and you know, and then later you're kind of trained to love them. You know, so I think you get your your best response a lot of times from children. Yeah. So, but um, but a lot of times I, it's intentional. I want it to lure your lure your, lure you in with color and and happiness, and then there'll be a darker side to it that has a different meaning once you um, see what it's about. So. There was something else I wanted to ask you about. Yes, I think about these things sometimes in advance. Usually it's off the cuff, but today I was thinking about how so many of your pieces have this abundance, abundance mm -hmm. of form, abundance of shape, um, repetition of volume, and it kind of made me think that it's very American. I know I just mm. like likened your thing to the African with the shamanistic quality, but the the consumerism, mm -hmm. if you don't mind me saying as much, and you can say no, I'm offended, but no, that that's abundance is mm -hmm. very American. Mm -hmm. And and I was wondering how did that come to be? Is that like being in the heartland? Is it just being an American? You said it's intentional. I'd love to know your feedback on that. You know, it, it, it is a statement on that, mm -hmm. for the most part, because I, I, I do travel a lot, and I, I uh, to other countries as a flight attendant, and then I see how Americans are, and through what is popular on television, yeah. and uh, in pop culture, so um, it is a statement definitely on that, like the, that Marie Antoinette piece that I showed, uh, that was made out of all plastic bags, was actually, I was thinking, well, you know, we're just as guilty of excess and apathy, and yes, she has this reputation of let them eat cake, but it's almost like we're worse now, yeah. <laughs> like everyone, you know, so um, it, it's definitely an awareness of that. And I'd also add to that, that emphasis on things that are shiny, mm -hmm. things that are new, mm -hmm. um, the pursuit of using uh, commercialism mm -hmm. to get messages across, and mm -hmm. then it's made me think of television, like, mm -hmm. To all the generations that have come since the advent of TV and how we're indoctrinated into so many of these images mm -hmm. um, and the constant selling of something. Mm -hmm. When I see your art, it's almost like, it's, it reminds me of that, mm -hmm. but not in a bad way. I mean, it makes me mm -hmm. think of like after school specials, I think of cartoons, I right. think of jingles, mm -hmm. and, and you know, it goes down really, even though there's some elements that might be kind of spooky, it goes down very easily. I mean, yeah. I like it. Oh, thanks. That's yeah. great. Well, I try to take like the realm of good and bad behavior of humans mm -hmm. and kind of put it back in your face. And and so at first you can absorb it easily, and then maybe a couple of days later you'll, you'll think about something that I did or something that was on that piece, and, and it'll make you question. So um, like down here in Chinatown, um, I did a piece where I was a a talking parrot and the idea behind that was I only said whatever was said to me to see what would come out and for the most part people laughed and thought it was fun and of course the children you know once again loved it and were really honest and then eventually a couple people 
got really angry and started shouting at me and I would just say back in a parrot voice exactly what they said <laughs> and they had all this agenda that I was working for these people and write you know these books and I found that really interesting that they were taking didn't realize that it was their words that yeah. I was just repeating Wow! but that's kind of the the ultimate of what I was trying to say about me taking human behavior and and then maybe a couple of days later maybe they they probably didn't think about it, actually. <laughs> Those people probably didn't, but, but that was the intent. A couple more questions here, just random stuff. Because you are influenced, as I would like to say most artists are, things that are going on, current events, do you ever have that impetus where you just, you have to create something, it's like you have to almost purge it or get it out of your system, and then once it's done, you feel like you have a sense of peace that it's been done, or do you like to revisit themes over and over again? I mean, some people have made a whole career out of painting whales, right? and they paint whales over and over again. And some people say, okay, this is my blue phase. Mm -hmm. um, how is that for you? Do you find that you, once you've addressed something or you've gotten out of the system that it's already done with, or do you like to revisit it and do variations on a theme? I would say I revisit and, and do variations on a theme, and after, after I finish with that theme, then I, then I move on. But I, I like to, I've been trying to do kind of more of a series so that I would have more of an uh, exhibition to show, like with the small sculptures that I've been doing. But, um, but for me, it just, uh, I just go more by inspiration. It's not really planning, but I think naturally, I go through a series of things and then go on to the next thing. Yeah. Some would say that art is universal, but we certainly understand that there are different things that are expressed in certain cultures or subcultures or groups. You have some upcoming shows and works in Maryland that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the art scene as being similar or different compared to, say, a place like Hawaii? Um, it's been a great experience, actually, because it's it it it's not it's in a suburb, and I thought that it would be more. It's it's very similar, I yeah. guess I would say. You know, I, I'm I am finding it to be very universal, yeah. and that people are having the same issues because it, the the world is smaller, and through the internet and television and and movies and everything anymore. So I think we do pretty much have common issues. I mean, there's definitely some that are directly Hawaiian issues and probably some that are definitely Maryland issues, but right. um, I, there's a lot of general issues that I think touch base with everyone. I'm fighting the urge to say crab cakes. I just lost the battle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think Maryland, crab cakes and John right. Waters, you know, what else do you need well, to that, know? Yeah, and I love John Waters. He's so, fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Pink flamingos, it scarred me in the best of mm -hmm. all ways. Mm -hmm. We won't go into detail about <laughs> right. that. Yeah. Um, but there's something else that I wanted to ask you about, and that is this idea or this concept of naive art, because mm -hmm. there's a possibility that some people who don't know your background will mm -hmm. say, well, oh, here's a dude and he's got plastic bags. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, so for some reason, art has a tendency to bring out a very competitive streak in people. Mm -hmm. Like they go to an art show and they're like, well, I could do that and I could throw paint on a canvas. And it's mm -hmm. like, but you didn't. Right. You know, I, I could take newsprint and I could make a collage, but mm -hmm. you didn't. When people see your art and they don't know your background, are they surprised to find out that you went to art school? I mean, does it kind of like... I would say it's, I get the spectrum from both ends. Yeah. Some people, you know, really love it, and then I will get that reaction from other people, you know. Yeah. Like for an example of that, when I was at Spalding House making the raft maze that I showed, right. there was a, a parent with her child trying to climb on the bronze butterfield, I think it's oh, butterfield horse, yeah. um, that's, that's outside. Perfect. And um, she said, no, honey, don't touch that. That's artwork. And he turned around, grabbed one of my wraps, pulled it out of the ground and started shaking it and yelling it and yelling. And she was just smiling. And I was like, excuse me, this is my art. I'm working on it. She said, oh, I wasn't aware of that. So um, I think because of the material choice yeah. that I use, people don't realize sometimes that it's art. But I'm totally fine with that. Interesting stuff. That's a dramatic pause. <laughs> I thought you would enjoy that. 
You know, something that um, we've worked on together in the past. Yes, I've had the honor yeah. of working with you, which was uh, Dia de los Muertos. <clears throat> you did a great three-dimensional piece. I regret not having a photo of that um, right now to show. Mm -hmm. That was that was articulated and it had movement and um, what have you. Is this the first? I'm not going to think this is the first time you've done a piece in memoriam to somebody of importance to you. Have you done a lot of work to uh, to honor the spirit of somebody who's passed on or someone who's influenced you? Not a lot, but I have. I have done a couple pieces, yes, yeah. before that. But then, yes, I brought these uh, glasses for Willow because they, I, I found <laughs> these little black rose glasses and then I added a little uh, skeleton with crystals on it. You just um, know me too well. Can I put them on, on right now? <laughs> these bright lights in the studio, I just, this is exactly what I need. Makes me wish I was a drinker because oh. this would really <laughs> it would conceal a hangover quite well, I think. Oh, didn't think of that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. These are Good fabulous. Point. I'm not sure which of our cameras here, one or two, that can get a close up, but you must see we've got we've got black roses here and we have a lovely little uh Tia de los Muertos skull there with a rose, a little Catherine. Oh, with a veil and some rhinestones. I I might have to put in my will that I would like these on my corpse before oh. I go to the, <laughs> the underworld. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I will enjoy so this. So I was thinking about you in England. Oh. <laughs> I'd make the heart sign, but my dress is too close to my body <laughs> to put my hand down there. Ooh, I think I might be flashing, you guys. Okay, I digress. You have, um, you travel with frequency. You've mentioned that. Mm -hmm. How did those travels influence you? I mean, for myself, I find that, yes, when you're in the moment, you're like, ooh, 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 ooh. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's the time after, that incubation period mm -hmm. when you have a chance to reflect or digest or let it settle. Mm -hmm. How do you find that your um, access to travel has affected your artwork? Well, it's mostly through work, mm -hmm. or believe it or not, because um, now when I travel, I try to, I try to, I go to, a whole bunch of exhibits when I'm, I, I fly to New York, which is great, you know. Right. So then I, I go out there to different museums and exhibits, and then I mostly go to Paris and London um, because there's, they have great museums and I'm influenced there. And then I would say on my break time when I'm flying, when I'm <laughs> supposed to be like, you know, relaxing, it, then it all comes through my head like crazy and I, I start jotting down notes. And then my commuting back and forth is so far that um, a lot of times halfway through the flight, uh, it'll just start coming out and I'll end up not having enough time in that commute to finish what I was trying to work on. Yeah. So it really does influence me a lot. And then here is um, you know, totally influenced by the beauty of everything. So um, it's, a, it's a, my body is really angry <laughs> with me, but my creative spirit loves it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, is your body angry? Well, we're going to give you probably like a 30 second break. So get back to the happy place and don't change the dial. This is the art of life. My name is Alice Lee Hagen. I host the Think Tech Hawaii Biz Ed Spotlight. We talk about fascinating people and interesting, pe interesting issues that affect our island state here in Hawaii. We broadcast every Thursday from 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 and on Olelo 54. Make sure you tune in and we'll see you soon. Aloha. Most of your art so I can tweet it. Aloha. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the art of life. How could you not know? It's like right over there by my shoulder. This is the art of life. And today our guest is Robert Reed, artist extraordinaire. He's on the hot seat. We're asking him all kinds of questions about his creative process and how he came to be and, and traveling. I'm going to slightly go off topic, but since you were talking about travel and you are in the industry, mm -hmm. are there any koans of wisdom that you can share with us, little peons about how to make our travels more enjoyable or a little more sane or, or things that you would like us to know as passengers that just irritate the bejesus out of the flight company? I mean, I'm uh, all ears. Well, I don't ring that bell <laughs> unless it's an emergency. Go back and get it and bring it back to your seat. And don't get up. 
you know, right when we're in the aisle with the cart because it's, those things are heavy. You know, oh. So it's really a lot to, to move around. But on the other hand, you know, I commute and it's actually helped me mm -hmm. to be like a passenger and, and, and I know how hard all that is. You know. I am curious, and I know it's probably different for every airline, but it, it seems to be the domino effect that when one airline uh, takes on, they're like the big bad guy and they do something, boo hiss, but then everyone follows suit. Mm -hmm. So that being said, what happened to those blankets? Oh. <laughs> I bring my own blanket because right. <clears throat> I think of them Native Americans and pock fill blankets, mm -hmm. but I liked to put them in my lower lumbar mm -hmm. spine, and I noticed when I flew with, I won't say who, the blankets are gone for us right. little peons in coach. What happened to the blankets? They go back and forth. I'm trying to save money. You know, okay, so. so it's a money thing. But always, always, if you're near a, a window exit, yeah. you bring a lot of clothing to work. It's, it is true. You might even pay more to sit there, but it, it's cold. And I have another totally other leg. I thought this was about art, but it's the art of life. How is it that sometimes they have things with nuts and sometimes they have things without nuts like how is this do they ever tell you guys or brief you how these decisions are made or is it just no. oh today we have nuts today we don't have nuts today there are no nuts today there's no, no nuts we usually nuts. find out in the news everything yeah. <laughs> really <laughs> honestly but. my father used to say i'm the last to know and mm. now i carry on that tradition mm -hmm. but i thought i would ask you because you're in the know okay. yeah I'm curious also how you transport your art. I mean, do you pay a company to to pack that? I mean, some of these things, they're kind of on the fragile side. So your artwork that you're doing in Maryland, are you constructing it here and then taking it I there? I construct or it and ship it, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. It just sounds very so, arduous. Yeah, it is. So, um, but on the other hand, now I have room to make more. That's Not true. much, but I have a little more. So. Um, yeah, I have to ship it. That's, I mean, that's one of the, the problems with Hawaii, for sure, is that it's, it costs a lot to ship anything. This is true. Mm -hmm. This is true. Um, I'm digesting. Yeah. I'm thinking of all of your things that are prating. I'm thinking of that poodle with that large naga hide. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can't scrub it from my brain. Um, right, some things, but I, I try to plan on that a little yeah. bit, like the time capsule piece that I made out of uh, with using the food saver bags, mm -hmm. that I could take it all apart, PVC pipe, and it's very lightweight, so yeah. I, you do have to consider that as an artist being in Hawaii. I think you, know, you don't want to make a big bronze heavy thing because it's going to cost you a fortune to ship it unless you can get the person that's going to buy it to pay for the shipping as well. That's true. My version yeah, of that is. albatross is doing these theatrical dances that always have headdresses. Mm -hmm. And my dear friend Maysoon, I just gave you a shout out, she always <laughs> says to me in her Swiss German accent, like, darling, why do you make these pieces with these headdresses? You know, because you're literally bringing it halfway around the world. Right. But sometimes when you're in that creative process, that's the last thing you're thinking yeah. about. You want to stay committed to the vision of what you mm -hmm. feel is accurate to that expression so you yeah. know next thing you know you're lugging this thing half around the world in a right. box yes but i always go more for the vision than the money for I sure know. So. Well, but i think in the end it evens out you it know or hopefully evens it will out. Yeah, it so. does it does i'm curious what your favorite holidays might be do holidays give you like a little zing of inspiration and and what have you lord knows i've i've acquired many beautiful things from your partner's oh, store so yeah. we have a halloween tree that's a big deal at the changs but well definitely halloween and that's when we met was halloween so. <laughs> um yeah definitely halloween is the costumes i would say and christmas i'm i, I love all the glitz and the <laughs> the ornaments and i used to play with the ornaments as a child yeah. as toys you know so I, I really do love christmas ornaments so help decorate the store around Christmas time a lot. I actually enjoy it quite a bit. Is there something you'd like to share with our viewers about ways that they can kind of dip their toe in the water of, of daily creativity? Things that you find that have been helpful um, to or for you or for others, you know? Hmm. I w <laughs> Imagine if I'm like some granny and I'm saying, I want to, you know, Robert, I'd like to be more <laughs> creative. What could right. you recommend? Well, I would, you know, I, 
I mean, obviously, just try thinking out of the box. So um, I would just, if it's that, it would be like if it was that basic, I yeah. guess. I would say, well, just try something. This just came out the top of my head, but I would say, like, take your favorite image, mm -hmm. go to a mirror, turn it upside down, and draw it. You know, so that, um, and then try to change that image into something else or something like that, just to get people to try to think out of the box. Absolutely. You know, bringing it back to something you said earlier in the conversation, mm -hmm. you said, I start off with the sketch. I mm -hmm. completely relate to that. And you said, and what it becomes is different from the sketch. Mm -hmm. And I think that many people have a similar process. They mm -hmm. start off with one thing, or whether it's an idea or a sketch, a rendering, and then the finished product, if you call it that, finished or product, mm -hmm. it's different than how it started. And there's beauty in both of those things. But, mm -hmm. <clears throat> pardon me, some people have a very difficult time accepting that what it became doesn't represent, doesn't look like what they thought it should be. I mean, that's right. why I don't work with clay very often. Right. But the failed cake <laughs> syndrome or yeah, something. Yeah, but right. you know, I think that there's something very beautiful and meaningful mm -hmm. that you can start with some place and then allow it to become mm -hmm. whatever it's meant to become. Right. How would you encourage people maybe to take baby steps to reach that, that place of acceptance? I think you have to walk away from it mm -hmm. and come back and look at it a lot or look at it from different angles and things because I, I mean the same thing happens to me still, yeah. you know, like I'll just really fight with something and when you're really fighting with something, that's when something's trying to tell you that that's, you're going about it wrong because it yeah. should not be usually that difficult or it should be a little more of a natural process. So a lot of times that mistake is really where the art lies. So you have to, so then you have to accept it and say, okay, you're going to be like that and, and go on with that and build on with that. And you'll usually, at least I'm usually more excited about what happens in the end. Yeah, that's super. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of your work. I know recently you had some items at Linicona. Is that still up and about? Um, no, but I'm going to be doing the Nano Gallery um, November there, which is the tiny little gallery um, out by the staircase. So I'm okay. going to do a, um, an installation there. Super. So. Do you have a working title or we just have to stay tuned? No, I'm not really 100% positive what I'm doing Okay, yet, so. That's okay. <laughs> and I, I'm very picky about my titles. And I like to, pl I like it to play with words. It will come to you, so, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I do that. And then in October, I'm going to live in a thrift store and, and uh, Greensboro, North Carolina for three weeks and you um, it's called Elsewhere if anybody wants to go to their site and you should apply if that sounds interesting to you because they have six different artists at a time you you live in this three-story thrift store and you live and eat and everything there and then you create art only out of what is there and it's called a living museum and I'm really excited to see that just what sounds happens with that. So cool. Because my mother owns a thrift store too, so I have a lot of issues with thrift store <laughs> and uh, and just the way I work with this abundance of things and uh, it'll be interesting to see how what I come up with, I think. But really looking I'm, forward I'm to excited. that. Tell us once more your website just so our viewers can um, check it's you out. Fabulousrobertreed.com. FabulousRobertReed.com. That is the truth. We've run out oh, of time, thanks. unfortunately, but I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you. And great. would love to have you when you come back so you can follow up and tell us about all the good stuff that happened in, in North Carolina and Maryland okay, as great. well. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Stay tuned for our next show, and please tune in next week as we will celebrate one year of the art of life. Woohoo! How exciting. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend. I'm your host, Willow Chang Elion. We're keeping it Pono. Ciao.